a little too busy now for that kind of thing, but just for its own sake, it might be interesting. So uh, Socrates held this position, as I say, a middle ground position, which is that there must be absolute truths, but he didn't know them. Th why that's important is that gives a reason for the dialogue. When Socrates questions people about beauty, honor, justice, truth, I finally mentioned the big words philosophy's after, right, you know? When he talks about them, and they all sound like pompous words today, I just feel crazy, to, you know, discussing philosophy today. Because in a society sort of where, uh, uh, as one modern philosopher put it, cynical reason prevails, the very use of these words is bound to just sound like advertising slogans. That's the objective context within which people who try to teach what I teach have to fight a kind of historical battle. Because, I mean, how in the hell can I compete with... Well, I'm on television right now, hello. Uh, now, how can I compete with a huge media and advertising industry that uses these same words that used to code the most important things about human beings as the characteristics of products which you can get in a mediated way by consuming them? See, it's, it's just so difficult then to re-establish sort of their meaning. But for Socrates, it was crucially important to try to get at the meanings of these words. Truth, beauty, goodness, courage, justice, and so on. And it was important not only for its own sake, but for what it would tell him about himself and about his fellow citizens. So it was a profoundly civic act. Thus, when Socrates was found guilty at his trial, he suggested that the state should not execute him or, ex or even send him to exile, but rather should put him up as a public figure to be supported by the state forever for the service he performed for it, okay? Which, uh, w in a Greek trial, that was not a good counter sentence. That was liable to irritate the jury, right? You know, could, could really tick off the jury. Uh, it didn't seem to hurt in the Ali North affair, but, you know, Socrates probably didn't have that good a speech coach or whatever. In any case, let me give you the argument that Socrates gives against relativism because it's one of our little philosophical tricks we learn from him, and may itself be a piece of sophistry. But against people like Protagoras, Socrates would argue as follows, and this is uh, probably familiar to at least some of you. He, he would take the proposition, the truth, for example, being one important concept, the truth is relative, about which he would ask Protagoras, is the sentence you just uttered, the truth is relative, itself a relative truth? or an absolute one. Well, if Protagoras or some other sophist responds that it's an absolute one, then there is such a thing as absolute truth, and they've discovered at least one of them, that the truth's relative. On the other hand, if the truth is relative, then if you hold Socrates' view that there is such a thing as absolute truth, you're absolutely right too. You see how the dilemma works? Either way the relativist responds, a space is opened up in which it's possible to search for truths that transcend the here and now. Because if the, either there's one absolute truth, that there aren't any, so then, there, then you might begin to say, well, there might be others. You figured out one. Maybe I could too. On the other hand, if you respond the other way, uh, then at least a view like Socrates is still absolutely right, because everybody's absolutely right. So of course Socrates is, too. So this famous sort of self-referential problem continues this day to be a, a sort of thorn in the side of what I would call sophomoric relativism. It really is a problem for that position. Okay, uh, back again now to the, uh, to the human meaning of the Socratic project. Uh, and now I'm going to do just a little biography, which is not really... Well, biography of this kind is supposed to have a little philosophic import. Not only was Socrates uh, 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 ugly and uh, uh, sort of a pain in the uh, behind, but the people that he questioned on the various topics in order to find out more about himself and about his fellow citizens were experts. And this is another point where I would like to contrast us with modern society. It's really hard to imagine a citizen publicly confronting Diane Quayle and being allowed to go on 
for 30 minutes on the, well, since Quayle reads the Republic, he reads Plato, so you ought to be able to do this, right? Or what is it that he tries to read Plato? That's, that's I guess that's different. But anyway, uh, to get a Socratic parallel, you'd need to imagine another free citizen encountering him and going, what is statesmanship? See, all the Socratic dialogues are sort of the Socratic ones. They're Plato writes other later dialogues. The Socratic dialogues are all of the form, what is X? Where the X in question will be one of these important words to human beings. So you go, what is statecraft or politics? And he will go to someone who is understood to be an expert by the society. I mean, they'll be in that. If it's courage, he'll go to a general and ask, what is courage? Now, I think how Socrates got in trouble, other than being ugly and irritating, was that as he questioned these people, it became apparent that they didn't have the faintest idea of what the hell they were doing, which is a feeling I get every time I walk into a mall. I look at people, and I just would like to say, what are you doing? And, you know, after you get the word shopping, what the hell do you suppose they'd say? Well, it, it's Saturday, and everybody's got to be somewhere, and, you know, I mean, uh, Socrates would like nail you and keep going with that what are you doing question. Where what are you doing carry the connotations of more than just right now, but what are you doing with your life? What's it about? Does it have a theme? Is there anything important going on? Which is an even more important question today when the planet is full of more people, right, than have lived in the whole previous history of the world. We need an answer to that just to justify taking up the amount of air we do. There's so many people on the globe, we're in somebody's way right now. So it's, it's good to have an answer to the question of what the hell are you doing? So philosophy, I'd like to start this course with the banal question that we should at least try to develop some answer in our own life to a question as simple as what the hell am I doing? And you would be surprised. I mean, some of you go, well, I know what I'm doing. Well, if you, Socrates' uh, presumption was that if you thought about it long enough, you wouldn't be so sure. You wouldn't be so sure about it. Uh, in any case, I was talking about how he got in trouble, this, and trying to get in a little trouble too, maybe. Uh, Socrates would uh, confront a general, a statesman, a poet, you know, great artist. What's great art? Well, we know the kind of answers you get there. Have you ever read the interviews that, with William Faulkner? Aren't we all glad that he wrote, that he didn't know what he was doing? Because if he was doing what he said in his interviews he was doing, the books would have been just, ugh, but because he didn't know what the hell he was doing, we were lucky. The books are great. Thank God they're not as stupid as what he said about them. <laughs> See? And Socrates so would ask a poet, what are you doing? And the poet would just say some completely off the wall stuff. And thank goodness that they expressed themselves as poets and not, didn't have to explain themselves. But the, the Socratic drive was to get people to explain themselves. Now, a social thing that happened in Greece that was unfortunate for Socrates was that the young would gather around to listen to these conversations. And you can imagine a scene something like this with some young people gathered around, Dan Quayle forced not to leave and nobody to pull him away in a 30-minute discussion with a, at least a clever person like Socrates about statecraft. One can imagine a sort of 15 or 16-year-old today raised on Public Enemy and MTV the kind of hilarity that might arise and the irritation that Quayle might feel trapped in such a situation, he would consider it trapped. But for the Greeks, it would be of the essence of being a free person to be in a situation of dialogue like that. In any case, it's another difference. In any case, uh, the, uh, the, this got him in a lot of trouble and was another factor that led up to uh, the rather dramatic title of this book, which is really a collection of the various dialogues about the trial and death of Socrates, which led up to his trial and subsequently being sentenced to death. So philosophy has, in terms of human values, I think a rather noble beginning. It, be it begins in a quest for meanings that transcend the here and now. 